One for the mechanics. This is a brake fluid tester and it's got two little electrodes in the end. And when you submerge it in brake fluid, it tells you how much moisture there is in it. So let's zoom in a bit. So if I turn this on by pushing the button end, you'll see a green LED light. And if I put it into good brake fluid, then that green LED stays lit. And that means that there's not a high moisture content in the liquid. I will wipe this off. It will also go off itself after a time. It's got a little time delay. If I turn it on again with this very hard to press button, green LED is lit. I put it into water and it goes straight to the red. Very dim red, I have to say. It's actually got three LEDs. Uh, green for good high resistance fluid, because that's what it's measuring. Yellow for on the edge of needing changed and red means it definitely needs changed. And the reason for that is that most dot four uh, liquid, well, all dot four liquid is based on glycols and corrosion inhibitors. And glycol is very hygroscopic. It absorbs moisture from the air. And if it absorbs too much moisture, its boiling point lowers because one of the main attributes of this is it does have a very high boiling point. And the idea behind that is that if your brake system was hot and the liquid started venting out gas, it would then provide a sort of spongy buffer and it would prevent the brakes operating, operating fully hydraulically. It would be almost like air in a hydraulic system. So this thing literally just measures the continuity of the liquid. Let's put that out of the way. I just tested my car. It was fine, but I changed it anyway. It was due for a fluid replacement. If you take the end cap off and you slide the circuit board out, it has a single AAA cell, uh, the three LEDs, a little boost circuit, the look of it, with inductor and capacitor, an anonymous microcontroller, and an LM358 chip. So let's explore this further. I shall take a picture of it. Oh, let's squeeze the... Let's lick my fingers and gently put it over these. There's the yellow. There's the red. Okay, dokie. And it latches the last one that triggers. Okay, I'll take a picture of this and then we can explore the circuitry together. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. This took longer to reverse engineer than I was expecting because it works differently to the way I was expecting. I thought it was going to be something very simple. Initially, I thought this chip was an LM358 dual op-amp and it was just going to detect to resistance levels by measuring the voltage and using, say, potential dividers just to compare it to that. But it does not. It's much more complicated. In fact, only half of this comparator, which is what it actually is, it's an LM393, is actually used to measure the voltage on for both levels. So on the circuit board, we have the little boost chip for the 5 volt supply, OC DCJE. I think it's D. Might be an OCJE. I couldn't find that from that number, but I did find a identical pinout chip. And uh, it's based on, a, it's got an inductor, a little shock diode in a transistor package, and then a tantalum capacitor to provide a, a DC supply at 5 volts. Uh, other things worthy of note, there are two dual shock diode packages here in SOT23 packages, and they're on both the uh, probe pins. And the reason for those is to provide anti-static protection for the chip, just to make sure that any high current spikes as you approach maybe a charred surface with this probe uh, are dissipated to the, the supply rails so the chip doesn't actually see that as a rogue voltage in its input. Um, anything else worth mentioning here other than the anonymous microcontroller not really let's cut straight to the schematic. Incidentally, this device was Silverline branded electronic brake fluid tester. Silverline being a generic tool brand here in the UK. Cheap and cheerful, but usually useful. So we'll start off with the first page of the schematic, because there's two pages. And uh, it's the power supply, the bit that steps the AAA cell, 1.5 volts or less, up to 5 volts for the circuitry. And initially this is off because it's got an enable pin and it's normally pulled down by these two resistors here to the zero volt rail. The reason there's two resistors is because the microcontroller can also turn it on. So when you push this button, it initially applies power to the enable input and the circuit powers up and it starts generating the 5 volt supply. The 5 volt supply powers up the microcontroller. The microcontroller, once it's stable, starts a timer the time it's going to run, and then it applies a positive signal to this P1 
pin here and that then overrides the button so even if the button's pressed well normally you just click it and let go but uh, once uh, the microcontroller provides that latching signal it then drives the enable pin high and then later on when the timer has expired and it's time to switch unit off all the microcontroller does is it basically takes that low and this will just shut off and the voltage goes down and the, the unit is going in its sleep state before that though power is able to flow from the battery through this inductor through the Schottky diode and to the microcontroller but the microcontroller's got a under voltage threshold that it will basically shut into standby during that time um this is also incidentally the path for the current for powering this little chip which initially is initially powered from the battery via that Schottky diode but then when it actually generates the 5 volt supply it powers itself from its own 5 volts and the way it generates the 5 volt supply is it repeatedly pulses this inductor down to the negative rail building a magnetic field and then when it releases it and the field collapses the high voltage spike goes through this diode to charge up the 5 volt supply and incidentally that power supply uh, pin also doubles up as monitoring for the um, 5 volt level so it only pulses as much time as needed to keep that 5 volts there is a tantalum bead capacitor odd choice but reasonable enough and then I've drawn a decoupling capacitor here for the um, microcontroller it's on the the, the microcontroller is on the next page but I've just drawn its decoupling capacitor here other things worthy of note and this really threw me initially I wondered if they were cheating and using this initially as just doubling up in these resistors as a potential divider for a voltage reference and then I wondered if they were using the little zener that's in this to cap the voltage as a reference which would be a very rogue thing to do but it's not this signal goes back to one of the op amps and it's either the microcontroller signal which is about 4.7 volts by the time it's uh, gone through well I think it's been capped by this but if you push the button while it's powered, uh, that input, the 1.5 volts will override that 5 volts and the voltage in this will drop to 1.5. So remember that this little bit is pink and it's also not an op amp, it's a comparator, it's going to... But just remember that this little pink circle here, that it will change in voltage depending if you push the button. So normally 4.7 volt in operation, push the button, that goes to 1.5. Let's take a look at the next page of this schematic oh incidentally this is a ncp 1400a i based this on the data sheet because uh, that is a pinout uh, that matches it uh, quite an odd one because the middle pin of the sot 23-5 is not uh, ground it's not the zero volts as they normally are so here is the circuit with its plus five volt rail and the zero volt rail the microcontroller switching the LEDs and it's got a 10k resistor going to it. I'm not sure why there's it must be an internal reference or something or maybe that's to a, a master clear pin and it's just pulled high via that resistor which is what pick microcontrollers often do this is where it gets a bit weird right so the output is AC at 45 hertz the reason for that is that if you stick electrodes like this into a liquid then if you apply DC across it it causes electrolysis effect the same reason that uh, humidity sensors have to have AC applied across them and that electrolysis effect results in chemical changes on the happening in the front of the electrodes that can actually result in electrical noise and also a change in resistance or potential difference across the electrodes so by using AC it protects the electrodes and gives it a stable output and they're generating that from the microcontroller just by using two pins one is high the other one's low and then vice versa so they're just jiggling backwards and forwards there is a main current limiting resistor here which also acts as a potential divider to a degree uh, with this resistor here actually no the it's actually the liquid is the other part of the potential divider with this 68k resistor and this little tap off here fairly high value is going over to the input of one of the uh, comparators that 45 hertz is also mimicked here and this really really threw me because i was looking for a fixed uh, divider providing a fixed voltage to the input to these uh, comparators but in reality what we're getting is a ramp generated by this resistor and this capacitor and because this is toggling at 45 hertz you get a ramp up and then a ramp down and when it's in the correct polarity for getting a, a 
voltage reading for from the liquid, this is ramping up. And when it reaches, it times it. And when it reaches the same threshold, then it actually triggers the op amp. And in the case of this, it's the orange line op amp, uh, then toggles. It's normally pulled high by these resistors, but it toggles and the microcontroller then knows that it's basically changed state. So by working out the time from the start of the square wave, it can measure roughly the resistance of the liquid. The other op amp is fed by the same ramped signal, but its input comes from the previous page and it's measuring purely the 4.7 volts or the 1.5 volts and you push the button. So at some point in that sort of square wave and the ramp, it's just going to time that and determine the button's pressed. I tried holding the button. I tried pressing the button repeatedly to see if it stood, stayed awake. I tried pressing and holding it for a long time just to see if it went into a calibration mode. I tried multi-clicking at various combinations. I could not get it to do anything, but I wonder if it's designed to respond to being in a liquid of a specific resistance range or just in the lab, I'd guess, they just stick resistors across it. And then maybe if you press it, it goes into calibration mode. I don't fancy doing that because it would put it out of calibration. But I couldn't work out what that button input being able to be read by the, the comparator was for. And then, basically speaking, it measures the voltage in whichever it starts off with the green LED, and then if it's roundabout, I made a note of this. I made a note it was about 220k. It switched to yellow just by putting uh, a variable resistor across these contacts, and then it was 150k. It switched to the red. Uh, but that is it. A very odd circuit, quite tricky to reverse engineer. But useful things. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier in the video, but there's this thing that people throw uh, the brake fluid on other people's cars to ruin the paintwork. It's just this thing that some people do. And it's really odd because the glycol itself is not really actually corrosive. They can't use a corrosive material in the brakes because it would damage the cylinders it would dra damage the brake lines but what it is glycol is a, the glycols they use are used as a solvent in paint so that can actually basically dissolve the paint just by purely the fact it is a specific solvent to that paint but interesting stuff also glycol being moisture absorbing and tend to hang around it will just if it gets in a surface it will just stay wet in that surface because it absorbs moisture from the air but very interesting circuitry works a completely different way than I was expecting, and presumably it's okay. Certainly it showed my fairly stable brake fluid was fine, and certainly the new stuff was fine, but certainly dipped in water, which is how they recommend testing it, which is a very non-scientific way, uh, certainly showed that, that it went straight to red. This cover also very oddly has graduated from about 90 milliliters up to 80 milliliters. Not really sure. Maybe this doubles up as a little hygrometer or something like that in another product. Not really sure. But interesting stuff. Uh, well worth taking apart and seeing what made it tick, even if it did take somewhat longer to reverse engineer than expected. Quite neat though. Very clever circuitry.